This morning, two panels are taking place. The first one will address demographic change, and the second, starting at 11 o'clock, will deal with the spirit, power, and the role of Central Europe. The moderator of the first panel today is Ms. Louise Wies van der Laan, a Dutch politician and vice president of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. Ms. van der Laan was a member of the European Parliament and the House of the Representatives of the Netherlands. In her rich political career, she also serves as Chief of Staff of the President of the International Criminal Court and was a moderator at BSF Special Panel on International Criminal Justice last year. The moderator of the second panel that we organize in cooperation with the International Visegrad Fund is a renowned Slovak expert on international relations and civil society, senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund and broad member of the European Endowment for Democracy, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Slovak Republic, Dr. Pavel Demes. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming the panelists and my dear friend, Luis Wies. Let's start this interesting morning discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Is this one on? Yes, great. So, uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I feel very honored to be uh, here back in Bled. Um, too bad the weather is not, uh, not as beautiful as it was last year, but I think Bled is always beautiful under any circumstances. And I'm very honored to have such an incredibly distinguished panel here this morning to discuss um, what I think is uh, one of the most pressing topics uh, um, facing us at this moment. And I wanted to get a feeling first from the audience, well, I want to get a feeling if you're awake or not, but I want to get a feeling um, about the title. Because of the, of course, the title is Demographic Change, Is It Another Threat or an Opportunity? Um, and if you had to choose, now we know, of course, and we're going to be discussing the next one and a half hours on all the nuances uh, of this, but the way demographic change is going now, if you would have to choose, who would say it is a threat? Hands up. Don't be shy. Who would say it's an opportunity? Very good. And the people who didn't put up their hand, go and get some coffee, because you know this is supposed to be very, very interactive. Um, and, and I would like to actually kick off the same way with, uh, with the panelists, just so you can, uh, you can, we have an opportunity to meet. And you, of course, we'll be talking along this. If we have to go first, uh, I'm going to go first to, to my left here. Uh, Mr. Massaus is a state secretary from uh, Portugal. Would you consider it, now you have to choose more threat, more opportunity? Uh, well, I guess the political, politically correct answer is to say opportunity, but I'm going to say threat. Um, it's become um, a considerable uh, challenge or threat to Portugal, and we're starting to act on it. Um, and I understand that there may be opportunities, but the, uh, my immediate instinct is to regard it in, in some respects that we're going to talk about later as a, as a difficult problem for our societies to, to deal with. Great. Thank you very much. Mrs. Koju, for, for you, I mean, obviously, you, are, do you have to say it's an opportunity because you represent uh, the, uh, the pensioners? <laughs> I, th I congratulate you because you said what majority of them think because they are politicians and they know that they shouldn't say it's threat. Uh, actually, it is threat now for many countries, including Slovenia, but it could be opportunity and therefore I'm here today. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I go to the extreme left here, Ms. Mikonen. I mean, it's, it's your job to make sure it's an opportunity. If you look at the way things are going now, what would you say? Well, I would say it's a false dichotomy. I think that aging is, to look at aging in isolation and say it's this or that is a blessing or a, or a curse is, is, is fictional because actually aging is just a process of population dynamics. So we, will have, we, will, we, we have had massive population growth just in the last 60 years and then huge uh, fertility reduction, again, from 5 to 2.5 children globally in 60 years. Aging follows, that's logical. So I think aging is, is a consequence of success. It's actually the front line of success. And what we do with it is, is an, it's up to us. Right, and I think that's one of the things we'd like to discuss uh, in the coming, uh, coming hours you know, what are, what are we actually going to do with it? But first I want to finish my, uh, my little introductory line here. Mr. Windegger, you're with the uh, um, Austrian Ministry of 
Labor, Welfare and Consumer Protection. Did I say it right? No, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's um, Labor, um, and I have to think about it again. <laughs> You're going to well. translate it. <laughs> no, it's uh, Labor, Social Affairs and Consumer Protection. Here we go. But right. welfare as well. No, I mean, um, I believe that, uh, of course, I mean, the statement, it's, uh, it's said already, it's both, but I joined my colleague from, uh, from Portugal. I mean, um, it, at the beginning or a couple of years ago, it was a threat, but now I think uh, politicians and more and more people see the opportunities also in this kind of um, um, movement. Just to give you some, some numbers, I mean, um, a, uh, people aged 60 and older now we have about 700 million uh, persons, and this will be or reach uh, at the end of the decade one billion. Uh, by 2050, we will have um, more than two billion um, people, 60 and over. And this means also that uh, 2050, for the first time in history, there will be more people older than 60 than 14 years old. So I think. It's uh, a threat, but um, we have to tackle it now, and then I think we can make out of this uh, threat an opportunity to, to advance. Great. Thank you very much. And then last but certainly not least, uh, Mrs. Pensieri. And I have to confess that I have a very special affection for the, the Office uh, of, uh, on the, of the Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, also because I used to work with Navi Pillay. And, and these are the people in the United Nations who I find among the most brave, who speak truth to power, and who make you know, countries tremble with, uh, with reports that they do. And, and it's really a privilege that, uh, that we have you here. And uh, I would love, I think the audience would like to hear whether you see it a threat or an opportunity. Well, from two perspectives. From the perspective of one of the 700 million, I could I, how could I see myself as a threat? I see myself as an opportunity. And secondly, from the perspective of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, we do want to make the world a better place. We cannot, if we only look at issues from the perspective of what are the negative dimensions of it. So yes, there are challenges. We will be discussing the challenges that aging and demographic shift entail, but we have to do so with the pros perspective of how we ca can we leverage the positives. So also from that point of view, definitely an opportunity. Okay. Well, that's uh, wonderful. I think we have enough uh, uh, for debate already right now. Now what I've, I've asked the panelists to do is as part of their introduction about what they would like uh, to talk about here with you to kick off is to keep in mind that also this is being followed by uh, by video by uh, so welcome to to our viewers. Uh, of course you're very welcome to tweet the hashtag is bled14 um, and I thought as part of the introductory statements uh, I asked the panelists, you know, think about what would you like them to tweet about you? What would you like them to be the key takeaway? If, you know, only one message hangs, and we know, that, sadly, that's what happens with these conferences, one thing that you remember, uh, what, what would that, uh, that key message be? But now we have, of course, a little bit more time, so you can then explain why this would be your, your key message. I think I'm going to follow this, the same order, because uh, that works very comfortably for me with the microphone. Please, Mr. Massaus. Um. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Twitter. I, I, I tweet a lot, but uh, it's sometimes it's a bit difficult to to be that concise. Uh, I think my my main message, and maybe this helps explain a bit why why I picked a threat. Um, I think some of the demographic changes that we're talking about here, um, either population decline or aging, um, reflect in some important respects. Um, problems or even dysfunctions that contemporary society has. Uh, they are a symptom uh, of other problems. Uh, they are a bit like the um, canary in the mine that alert us to, to problems that exist uh, in our social and economic structures. Uh, and in that respect, uh, they are a threat, but they cannot be, that threat cannot be attacked directly. In fact, my conviction is that uh, in order to address some of these challenges, you have to think about rather fundamental changes to some of these structures. Um, and sometimes, so you know, if you, you're thinking about uh, public policy to address demographic challenges, uh, I'm not convinced that the best way to think about this is, for example, to uh, establish a number of subsidies uh, or tax breaks uh, for people who have more children. Um, if I'm right and the problem is a lot more um, global and cross-cutting and has to do with our social and economic structures from a broader perspective. 
then you have to um, uh, you you have to think more deeply about uh, how to address it. Uh, for example, um, renting laws uh, in, in a certain country. Um, if the renting market is not working properly uh, and the cost of renting is too high, this is certainly a problem for young families that want to, to marry and have children or to have children and not to marry. Um, and, uh, but it's also a problem for people who, who might leave alone or a, problem, a more general problem. So to go back to my initial point, I think that um, some of these demographic challenges reflect problems that should concern us even if we're not concerned about the demographic problem itself. Uh, they are more global, more general. Uh, they have to do with the labor market, uh, with economic, social institutions, and uh, with the migration in some cases. Uh, so very, very significant problems and we have to have a very subtle and a sophisticated approach to them. Great, thank you very much. Can I just to make it a little bit more concrete when you say, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I really like the notion of that the problem of, of, uh, of demographics is, a, is the cannery and the coal mine of larger social problems. You mentioned the, the housing market, which is not functioning. When you talk about the other social and economic problems that you see, uh, poverty, uh, lack of jobs, uh, education, what, what kind of very concrete things um, are, are you dealing with either in Portugal or do you see more broadly? Uh, well, there's certainly a problem of, uh, in, uh, in our education systems. I think that is clear. Um, we have to think better about how to uh, create the, the sort of patterns that allow people to learn throughout life. Um, we have to create patterns that allow people to have a broader education, a liberal arts education, not specialized. Uh, we have to create the right sort of mechanisms and institutions to uh, make uh, generations work better together. Uh, one of the problems of uh, aging, I think, is that it's going to reduce, and I, you know, I, I think it's probably already reducing the uh, uh, drive for innovation in our societies. Um, not because older people, city and citizens, are less prone to, to have uh, new ideas, but simply because uh, they are less exposed to those new ideas. They're not in school listening to the to the latest developments in science or, or otherwise. So if we could change that, uh, if we could establish a better communication network between uh, younger people and, and older citizens, and if we could expose um, uh, older citizens to, uh, to the same sort of uh, new experiences uh, uh, and new knowledge that we expose our young people to, then that could be addressed. Uh, but so this has to do with the general pattern of our society. These changes have to be careful, very cautious. Um, but it's not something that, it's not that people started suddenly to have less children because they don't have uh, the necessary tax breaks and we can address that directly. Uh, that's certainly not the problem. And in fact, that approach worries me and it seems a little bit like um, uh, an approach where you are manipulating the citizenry and almost uh, adopting what, uh, what academics call a, a biopolitical approach where you in a way, you try to increase patterns of reproduction or decrease, and I find that a rather unpleasant uh, way to, th to think about this. Uh, but certainly there are dysfunctions, problems, uh, uh, ways in which our societies force people to make choices that are, it's in some cases, rather tragic choices, uh, forcing people to have children very, very late, uh, otherwise you're going to be sacrificing your career. Uh, we see this every day with our friends, and, uh, and it, this has to be addressed, not just because of the demographic consequences, but because um, our societies could be better if we, if we yeah. address this. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, going from Portugal to another small country, to Slovenia, I have to say I was, I was very impressed by one of the, I think, coolest projects I've seen uh, here in Slovenia called Symbioza, whereby young people teach older people how to uh, work computers. And I was just thinking this is something that should be exported because I spend a lot of time on the phone with my mother who says, you know, how do I delete this word? And I said, look, mom, I'm in Slovenia, you're in France. But we need Symbioza, I think, to be projects like that to be exported because it's wonderful what old and young people can learn from, from one another, but uh, please tell us about your experience uh, and the work, work that you're doing here. It's your, please put your microphone on. Thank you. Uh, Super. I read uh, the sentence of uh, Nelson Mandela 
I, I'm sorry I didn't wrote it down, so I will just tell you approximately what he said. He said, the society which doesn't uh, listen to older people won't survive. Uh, all old books were actually written by old persons. <laughs> but I always uh, uh, thought about, um, are we really wise? But anyhow, the world is in troubles. And um, uh, I would like to tell you younger people that uh, you should listen more to older people. Uh, informatics pushed older people away. Uh, in post-socialistic countries, we have bigger troubles because young and ruthless who wanted to take our common wealth, they pushed older managers and politicians away just to be able to do this transfer. So we have bigger troubles. But um, uh, I would like to give you this message that uh, uh, if you, um, we are, with our fight, we are fighting in Slovenia for the rights of older people, um, um, for, for decades, um, the professionals in this field um, um, uh, presented older people as those who need uh, help, who need assistance. We have a big project in Slovenia, a, a project of self-help of older people, and we are visiting 130,000 older people than 69, and we found out actually that 49% of older than 69 don't need anything. They can take for themselves, can take care for themselves. That 39% of them need some assistance, which could be done by their uh, children, could be done by volunteers, by their neighbors. Only 15%, 12% of older than 69 need 24 hours assistance. So give chance to those who are healthy, who those who, uh, to those who have a lot of uh, experiences and knowledge, not probably in computers, but they have knowledge you didn't get because you are too young to get some, uh, some uh, experiences. Give them chance to take care, uh, care for themselves, to organize themselves, and to care to, uh, to help you. You know, the first step is that younger generations would recognize the participation of older people in the society. It's not my uh, thought. Uh, someone from Finland wrote this 10 years ago. Uh, we are actually helping your children. I'm sure that many of you have grandmothers at home who take care today because you are in Slovenia uh, for them. So recognize the value, the participation of older people which was done in the past, that's a special problem of post-socialistic country, and current assistance. We are not only uh, taking care for ourselves, helping our children, we are good consumers. You know, in the countries, I, I, as Slovenia is in big financial troubles, we are the only part of population, not the only, but the biggest part of population who, who uh, who spent uh, the pensions they get in one, two months, they return it in economy. That's important. Uh, so uh, if first you recognize the value of older people, then you will be able to use again our knowledge, our experiences, and our wisdom. And the final, um, you know, with our fighting for our rights, we are opening the space for you, for your old age, and that's the most important. Even in middle, uh, middle generation, I never thought about my old age, but you are so near to old age, so please <laughs> listen to us that we all together we will prepare the world uh, which will be changed. There will be more older people, but it could be um, better uh, uh, better managed and happier.
That's great. Well, as someone heading towards old age, we very much appreciate, my generation would very much appreciate all the work that you're doing so that when we get there, everything will be organized and we have nothing more to do. Just enjoy everything you've achieved. Thank you very much for that impassionate plea to use the wisdom of the older people. Um, since you mentioned Finland, I think that makes a nice smooth handover to, for me to go to, uh, to Epu Mikkonen, who, uh, you're, but the NGO you're not working for, Help Age, is not Finnish, right? It's a, it's a British or a global NGO. That's correct. So it's a global network and I'm at the secretary in London, but indeed, I am from Finland. Um, and it, I'm just thinking about the kind of one or two headlines that you were asking for. And I think the first one is really what I said already um, earlier, which is don't think of aging in isolation, because it isn't. It is part of a continuum that we have created. So population growth is a result of success and development. And dropping fertility is the same, it's a, it's a success. So to look at aging as an isolated trend just doesn't make sense. And I think um, in terms of um, really understanding aging, the problem that we have is that we do look at it in isolation and it's quite sort of emotional and kind of, in, if you look at newspaper headlines, it's very sensational. You know, we have the great tsunami, we have the age, aging time bomb, as if this was something that is happening really fast. Aging in, the kind of Europe, in Europe and OECD has been happening for 200 years, and in developing world, which is also aging, and actually a lot faster, this has been happening for the last 50 years. So it's nothing new. Um, and in terms of understanding it, I think there are a couple of, the big barrier to, to aging and understanding later life is that we have really poor tools. We'd, we've been talking about kind of production here and sort of how, uh, participation, but if we, if we really look at how we look at policy around aging, we use things like dependency ratio. Still, this assumes that everyone over 15 is working formally and no one after 65 is. And if you actually look at this, following up from, from, from my colleague who just finished talking about the, the grandparent care, the intergenerational interdependency is real. If you look at the care that is informal and often unpaid that older, older persons and often women are given by caring for their spouses, caring for their very old parents, or caring for their grandchildren has a huge economic value, but we don't calculate it, which is very foolish because if you just look at, if you look at the grandparent care, the UK did a calculation a few years ago, and it was something like over three billion pounds per year, which this care allows women to work which really matters to the economy today. We need to think about this. We need to make it possible and not a burden to the grandmother. And there was, I remember in Spain a few years ago, our grandparents were actually um, saying, we're gonna actually go on strike if you don't notice this, if you don't realize this. And people panicked because suddenly you can't go to work, you don't have childcare. But also in developing countries, if you look at things like migration, which is the wildest of cards when you look at population dynamic, I worked in Central Asia for a long time where migration is, is very heavy and in fact contributes a huge amount to the GDP. It is the grandparents who allow that because they are looking after the children when the parents migrate. And if you look at, well, African continent specifically, but the HIV and AIDS um, orphans are pri primarily looked after by their grandparents. And then if you look at sort of pensions, and this is the second point, I'm coming to the second point now, it's, it's not useful to think about aging as an issue of older persons only, because apart from the fact that we start to age as soon as we are born, it is, and really the kind of life course approach to aging really matters because suddenly you don't turn old when you are, I don't know, random 60 or 65 or 70 or 75. It's a whole process. But also if you look at issues that are generally associated with old age, like pensions, and this is of course a hot, hot potato politically and the cost and what are we gonna do, but pensions are not just for older persons or for old age. If, if I know that I have a pension in old age, I make different decisions in my life. If my parents have or do not have pensions, that has a di direct impact on me and how I use my assets and what choices I make.
And also, if we look at, there's, there's a wealth of evidence of looking at how pensions work in households. They're household transfers. A lot of the pensions are actually spent on the younger generation, generally on the grandchildren. And there was a study in South Africa, this is, this is quoted to death, but it's important. In South Africa some years ago, it was showing that pensions to grandmothers, specifically, um, showed that the grandchildren, and especially grand, uh, granddaughters in their care, were taller. So they had a better nutrition, they were less, there was less stunting. All of this somehow gets lost in the great tsunami conversation. And we need to get it back. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Mr. Windegger, please. Yeah, thank you very much. And indeed, I mean, a lot has been said on, on this uh, issue, which I also wanted to mention. I mean, being, as a, being um, a lawyer as a background, I participated in a lot of uh, international European meetings on, on this issue. And of course, there's a lot going on. Uh, with regard to the, to, the, to the rights of all the people, as we heard before. But um, what is important and what we discussed already in, in MIPOR in 2012 in Austria, I mean, it's what we heard already, the intergenerational exchange. I think, I think that's also very important for us. I mean, we have also projects in Austria where uh, senior citizens go to, into kindergartens and they play with the children. So, and what we experience that not only the, uh, the children, they can learn from, from the older person, but the other way around as well. As we heard before, um, that the young people, not only people in kindergarten, but they learned senior citizens how to deal with a computer, to use uh, Twitter or whatsoever. Yeah? So I think this exchange is important that we have fit on both directions, from old to the young generation, but the other way around. And we don't have to forget that um, even though um, society changed a lot. We have computers and um, everything is uh, on the smartphone, which definitely maybe some older people have difficulty to deal with. But somehow what we also experience that we can learn a lot of people. And I think that's also our position to give them a quality of life, to keep them in the work life, the workability of them, and that all the people um, can bring their experience, uh, and that's what you don't can have when you're younger, even though you know all this kind of um, um, technological uh, things, but the experience is well, what you can not really learn. So that's also our approach with uh, all the se senior citizens try to, yeah, to learn um, younger people, I mean, to prepare them for, for, for their life. And I mean, just to, to continue with this idea, I mean, what should happen then, of course, we, we need uh, more flexible uh, working time. I mean, all the people, maybe they don't want to work 40 hours again. So I think that's an important issue that uh, people who've re uh, retired or even they are going close to retirement, I mean, there are a lot of uh, flexible issues but that they work 30 hours or 20 hours and then they work uh, in the morning or in the afternoon, yeah? So this must, uh, is an issue which is, I think, very important uh, for us. And, yeah, and it's, it's, it's important, I mean, that's what I mentioned, that uh, we don't see it as a burden, but as an opportunity to, to learn from them. Thank great. you very much. All right, great. Thank you very much. Ms. Pensieri. Thank you. Let me start by making one observation. There's always a risk when one discusses an issue to look at that issue a little bit in isolation. Now we are talking about aging, but if we think in terms of what are the big demographic changes that we are experiencing, that is not the only one. There is aging as a phenomenon very much in Europe, but also in developing countries. And that's a good sign. It means we have higher life expectancy. I wish all of us to become old, to become old in a healthy way, but certainly that is, I suppose, everyone's objective. Uh, but there is a concurrent other trend, which is not evident in Europe, but elsewhere, and that is that we are having now the biggest youth population that the world has ever known. And these are young people who have a right to health, 
education and employment opportunities. So the way we manage at the policy level the expectations and rights of all these different groups and including the young and the less young uh, is what will allow us to have peaceful and well-managed society. The third dimension that is at play, and it has been mentioned by EPO already, is migration, which is providing very sizable demographic movements that impact on labor markets and opportunities. If we look at these three dimensions together, as a whole, then it becomes possible to recognize what might be some of the policy options. We have, in terms of labor now, the same imbalance that we have in income. Those who have too much and those who have too little, look at the work life. Those who work, theoretically, 40 hours a day and then not enough because they have to work much more, and I see many nods here. And, and those, the young, who are looking for a job, and those of older age who would like to continue to be engaged, but as you rightly said, maybe not 40 or more hours, but in a more uh, manageable manner. And so what we need is really to configure a way where our societies can take into account the needs of different age groups but also the contributions that they can bring to society. And that, that is this my first point. Secondly, in, along with these three main trends of aging, youth, and migration, there's also perhaps less evident, because it's been ongoing for a long time, a growing participation of women in the labor force. And that's, again, an aspect where um, older people come in with as a very important complement to uh, the state when the state is not able to provide all the child care needs and opportunities that might be required. So again, are we recognizing all these dimensions? Are we, are we paying attention of the fact that human rights applicable everywhere don't mean that one size fits all, uh, but means finding the right policy responses to ensure that rights to health, to care, and the possibility of contributing to society in a, in a constructive manner in line with one's skills, opportunities, and abilities are all promoted and respected. So I would argue that we need to look at the demographic change in terms of the aging population in the broader context of what are the other changes and how can they be, at the policy level, leveraged to become mutually supportive rather than looking at them in exclusionary terms. If we do this, we can't do that. And because then it becomes an issue of my rights versus your rights, and that is definitely not the way to proceed. Right. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think this is where we get to the interesting, uh, interesting questions. Okay, so we have the analysis. It's, it's very broad and it's complex, but then looking at the policy options, looking at the policy mix, uh, which, uh, which way do we go? So I want to turn first to the politician, uh, because I think there have been fantasies about, well, all these young migrants from the developing countries can come to aging Europe and can work in our hospitals and come, you know, work in our factories and then everything would be fine. And then looking at my own country, uh, we're not even willing to accept immigrants uh, from quite close by. And, and you know, you have anti-migration parties popping up, looking at the results of the European elections. Uh, being anti-migration is, is a, go a vote uh, winner in, uh, in many European countries. Um, so how are we going to reconcile the, the need for aging Europe for young people uh, and the uh, resistance to, to migration or the, the threat that some people see from migration. I mean, if we don't even want people to come you know, from Portugal to, to the Netherlands, let alone uh, from, from North Africa or further away. Um, well, we, we have to be realistic. Um, uh, migration or immigration is not going to solve the demographic challenge. I, I've looked at the numbers. Um, some of the countries in Western Europe, if we want the population to remain stable, eventually it would have to be made up of about 40% of immigrant population. Um, so the demographic challenge is enormous. Um, 
more immigration is part of the solution, but it has to be part of a policy mix um, because otherwise it will create problems of sustainability, some that you referred to already, uh, some of them legitimate, um, uh, others uh, we, have to be, uh, we have to fight against. Uh, but of course, in, in some uh, European cities, we see that um, local authorities or national governments had not been responding quickly enough to migration inflows. And then we have challenges in housing, we have challenges in public transportation. And this is um, really something that we should, um, we should be very careful about. Because then uh, uh, those problems we will translate into anti-immigrant feeling, and perhaps at the origin they don't have anything to do with that. They simply have to do with the fact that people have to wait uh, in big lines for the, uh, for the bus or for the subway and they didn't have to before. Uh, and if we had addressed that problem early on uh, in its specific challenges, we could have, uh, we could have avoided then, uh, uh, bigger problems later. Um, I think um, um, going back to, to some of the issues that were talked about earlier, and I think Flavia made an, an excellent point about we need more flexible rules. I was thinking that probably because one of the reasons that, that Flavia mentioned was, uh, of course, we've been uh, struggling very hard for higher equality in our societies, and we thought this would be done through equal rules for everyone. And there's a, a sort of an old conceptual confusion between equality and sameness. Equality is one thing, sameness is something different, and we shouldn't aim for sameness. Another reason is just the, the, the way our bureaucratic apparatus works. Of course, uh, it works much better with the same rules for everyone than with rules that are flexible and, and adapt to different people. But in Portugal, we've been looking at this very carefully because the crisis over the past three years forced us to think about um, the welfare state, how to reform it. And to me, it seems clear that we have to adopt more flexible rules. For example, if people want to retire at 65, they will have a certain level in, in their pensions. But they should be able to retire at 70 and have a much higher pension, or to retire at 60 and have a very low pension. And this choice should be open to people, and in many countries, or most of them, if not all, uh, you have the same rule, either because the bureaucratic apparatus wants it that way, or because uh, we think that this promotes equality. Uh, but it's going to have to be part of the solution. Otherwise, we're getting, and I'll go back to my description as a threat, we're getting to a very dangerous moment for our, for our welfare states, because the population dynamics becomes then self-reinforcing, self-feeding when you have very low fertility rates, uh, even if you increase them later, uh, if you had low fertility rates 20 years before, then people in their 20s will be a very small part of the population. Even if you have very high fertility rates, the result is still gonna be uh, very, very, uh, very low impact on, on population growth. So this is dangerous. It becomes self-feeding, it becomes self-reinforcing. Also in terms of, um, of cultural patterns. If everyone around you has only one child uh, and, mo and, and, and lots of people don't have children at all, it becomes sort of the social pattern that you accept and regard as, uh, as, as perhaps something you should copy. And then you do the same and this becomes self-reinforcing once again. Uh, so I am definitely, and we are in Portugal, very worried about this. Um, and the, the first, the most immediate challenge is the welfare state and how to make it sustainable. And I think part of the solution is to adopt flexible rules that allow people to work for longer years if they want to and if they are uh, healthy enough to do so. And then we can get all those experiences from other people. But don't try to increase it um, to 70 for everyone because for many people this is not uh, what they want for their lives and it should be respected. Great. Thank you very much. We will uh, be turning uh, to the audience at some point, so if you want to start thinking about how you would like to contribute to the discussion or start formulating some questions, you can start doing that already. I'm also going to ask the panelists if you want to come in at any point uh, to comment on what one of your panelists has said, that please, please do just kind of wave to me and I'll try to make sure we give everyone uh, the floor. But I, I wanted to, to turn uh, back to you, Ms. Pensieri, because I know that there has been some discussions at the United Nations for a separate convention 
Convention on the Rights uh, of Older People. Uh, I know Mr. Windegger is also so in involved in this. So, um, uh, and I saw the statement by Ms. Pillay who said, you know, sometimes it makes sense to have a dedicated instrument. Um, of course, you could look at it from the other side and say, my goodness, can't we start simply enforcing the rights that we have? And there's so many conventions which aren't being followed. Should we be spending all this energy, you know, drafting something new when we can't even um, apply the current conventions? So I would love to have your view on that. Well, the easy answer from the perspective of a UN official is to say this is a member state's decision. <laughs> and so I'll start with that. But of course, we do have views, sometimes very strongly held views. In this case, perhaps not that strong, but with maybe a slight leaning towards having indeed uh, a convention, an instrument that would uh, specifically target um, older people. Um, it's true, if we look at the Universal Declaration for Human Rights and the Covenants on Civil Politics as well as Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, they re apply to old, young, old and middle age as well. So what's the need? At the same time, if we look at the experience with the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, those are conventions that have identified a specific gender or age group as in need of tailored attention in terms of ensuring that their rights are respected. And I would argue that perhaps we can make the same case for older people. The advantage of the establishment of a mechanism is one, it's member states, so it's an indication of political commitment for the very fact that the discussion is taking place, the working group is meeting, and maybe in future a convention will be agreed by the parties, but also because every convention entails certain obligations. So states who become party to it are then uh, required to report regularly on how they translate the convention into practice. And it is this moment of, if you want, collective giving account of the actions undertaken that can provide that added impetus for policies to go from theory to real implementation. Because at the end of the day, I'm less concerned about the convention per se or whatever it may become, as I am concerned about states putting in place legislative measures that ensure that the rights of older persons are respected. Many, many legislations, for instance, specify that in employment you cannot discriminate by gender. None, to my knowledge, specifies that you cannot discriminate by age. So I know that if I were to apply for any job beyond the circle of the UN where they know me, uh, they look at my birth date and they say, waste paper basket, without going any further. And, and this happens uh, too often without the necessary attention of what is it that one can contribute to the economy, to one's society, and it is a violation of a very basic right. So on balance, I would say instruments are just that. They're instruments, but they help to get the work done. And if the convention can help us being more intentional at the policy level, in legislation, in actual practice, in terms of changing also the mentalities gradually of people in looking at youth and old age as being, as you said, the same continuum. Every young people eventually, if they're lucky, will get old as well. Um, then we would have leveraged the potential for, of an instrument to make real change in the life of real people. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, turning to you, Mr. Windegger, you've been, been more closely involved. Is this the general mood among the member states of the United Nations uh, that we're going to go for, uh, for one of these uh, conventions? General mood, I think it's difficult, but I definitely support what has been, been said. And I mean, uh, just let me say before that 
I also, we support um, that we have to do something immediately. We, we the Austrian government. We the Austrian, yeah. uh, sorry, yeah, the, yeah. the Austrian government. I mean, of course, the international um, community as well. I mean, we have uh, the MIPA, for example. I mean, we had the uh, Vienna Declaration in uh, 82, I think, and 2002 MIPA. And um, I think a lot has been done from 82 onwards. I mean, what has been mentioned before, I think for, for us, uh, the awareness raising is the most important issue. Yeah? And in this respect, of course, if we, we discuss this at the European level, at international level, and we can add something that um, um, discrimination uh, about age is mentioned more often in resolutions. People get uh, getting it back to their capitals, and we can do something. I think then then we can support it. But with regard to your question to the negotiations, I mean they are difficult because um, um, we, for example, the Austrian government, we also see that I mean. All the people, they are not a homogeneous group. The problem is, where do we start with, uh, when you're being considered as old? I mean, I talked to some of my near colleagues in, in the ministry, and uh, they're all about 55 to 62 or something. Some of them, they, they consider them not as old at, at all. Others, they, say, um, they agree to this kind of definition. So I think this is, and obviously, this is also a discussion what we are having at international and European level, that, um, how should we define old uh, old age? And secondly, what I want to mention that you have a different kind of um, cultures. I mean, the country or countries which are very um, pushing this resolution, this convention, are the South uh, American states, and towards the United States, Canada, the European Union, and some like-minded countries, uh, I mean, Russia and uh, China. But um, what I talked also to my African colleagues, because you can, can think about that they really support this uh, convention as well. But they told me that, I mean, there are so many international, um, um, how, do you, how do you say it? Um, um, In German? Agreements? agreements, yeah, agreement. Um, Obligations. Commit, commit, commitments they, they have to fulfill. I mean, the, um, the convention is always um, um, yeah, looked at it uh, uh, as well as with the convention, the rights of uh, persons with disabilities. Yeah? So, I mean, we, had the, uh, we were talking about uh, disabilities and uh, Suddenly, we had the disability convention, and uh, I mean, even in Austria, we had a lot uh, to change, and we realized that, of course, uh, a convention can raise awareness and bring differences. Yeah? But then, talking uh, to some Africans, they, they, they told me that uh, they have still problems with this uh, convention on the disabilities. So I think that, um, in our point of view, it's better to make use of the existing international human team. But at the same time, Sorry. At the same time, of course, we can have these uh, negotiations going on, but having already the outcome anticipated, let's say, in convention, I think it's, in our point of view, not the best way to get forward. So it must be a very um, good uh, discussion, discussing about the issue itself, what should be protected, and then I think we could also go forward. What my experience was at the, at the end, having these negotiations, that we are some kind of a deadlock because we have those countries who are in favor and the other ones who are against who say uh, there are no normative gaps. I mean, we all agree that something has, uh, must be done. Definitely, it must be done immediately. But um, there are not normative gaps. Um, we should um, implement, and especially I mentioned it again, MIPR, I mean, the best example, what we have, and uh, everything is... Uh, already in MIPR and, of course, in some other uh, international convention, as we mentioned before as well. Right. So I think the negotiations are difficult. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, in a way, it's good news that the African states are saying, you know, if there's another convention, we have to take the obligation seriously, and it's not going to be just a window dressing. And that, I think, in itself is good news, that we're not willing to have a convention just to have something and, and not, not to abide by it. Now, before I also open it up to the audience, uh, it's my pleasure to invite State Secretary Dominikus to uh, say a couple of words about an upcoming conference. And um, uh, 
Uh, let me give you the floor. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be today with you. Uh, good morning to all. What I would like to do is a kind of invitation for the participation in the event which will take place next year in Ljubljana in October 2015. Uh, actually, it's a festival which is taking place in Slovenia for more than uh, 30 years. It's a very important uh, event, uh, bringing together all the generations. And we would like to make this uh, event uh, internationally recognized. So we invite all of you to participate in the future event next year. But before I will, uh, I, I'm going to, 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 to say a few words about the event, I would like to say a few words about what was going on this morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate to the organizers of this event to put the issue of demography uh, and demographic changes on the agenda of this year's forum. Uh, I think it's very important, and coming from the uh, Ministry of Labor, Social Affairs, uh, it's an issue which we are dealing with very much in our ministry. Um, speaking about the uh, uh, dilemma, uh, threat of or opportunity, of course, it's a, a politically co correct answer is opportunity, but uh, uh, among many of us, it's a kind of threat. A threat because we are, do not speak about the issues, we are not debating about the issues related to demographic changes. And that is uh, what the Third Age Festival is for. It's opportunity for different generations to meet, to come together, and to openly discuss different issues relating related to the uh, aging and changes uh, in our society uh, related to the aging. Uh, we, of course, think that longevity should, be not, sh should not be a social burden, but it could be important uh, social uh, development potential, and we should discuss all the aspects of the uh, longevity openly, uh, freely, and this Discussion should be based on the uh, 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 b basis of collaboration and the solidarity between uh, generation. So what we would like to do is to open uh, the international forum uh, for debate about uh, changes related to the demographic aging, uh, not only speaking with a uh, uh, relation to the welfare society, to the uh, change of uh, social protection systems, but also in relation to uh, economy, to education, to human rights, uh, to political participation of uh, uh, elderly and old generations. Um, the uh, event is taking place uh, each year in the beginning of October uh, when we have uh, International Day of Elderly. Uh, and the next year it will be also organized in the beginning of October. Uh, we will uh, invite all the participants of the BLED Forum uh, to collaborate, to, uh, to, to, to come to this event, and we will, for the beginning, uh, uh, open some issue related to the uh, changes of a welfare society in Europe, to the change of uh, uh, social protection system, mostly related to the change of uh, uh, pension system, healthcare system, and long-term care system, and uh, we invite you very much to be the part of the debates in the next year's festival. Thank you very much for your attention. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. That sounds like a fascinating conference, and I see that some information was being uh, being handed out as well. So I'm going to turn now to to the audience. Um, don't be shy, and please, if you uh, raise your hand so the microphone can come to you. Can I have a microphone here in the? Second row, please, and please state your name and um, your, where you're from and maybe your affiliation, if that's relevant. Right here, the gentleman in the front, the very young gentleman in the front. Thank you very much, uh, Walter Lichem. I'm chair of the board of the European Training Center for Human Rights and Democracy. And I want to refer to a dimension that has not been touched when we talk about demographic changes. Uh, there's a social dimension 
but there is also a societal dimension. In fact, the societal processes of disintegration, fragmentation and the impact on the security, economic development, sustainability agenda is not being addressed. It's now almost eight years ago that an informal working group was constituted in New York to look at the issue of societal development. And in fact, the forthcoming High Commissioner for Human Rights was one of the members of that working group. But nothing has happened. What is societal? Just to briefly, societal defines the relational quality and capacities in a society. And it is that dimension that is moving to central stage in the 21st century, where we have uh, all the conflicts, disintegration, and crisis defined by a lack of relational capacities. And this now also is directly related to the issue of migration, of the pluri-identity society, and the exclusion of the aged. Myself included. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Pensiera, I saw you nodding vigorously, so please come in on this one. Yes, I was nodding vigorously and I fully agree with you because as we were discussing here as panelists, I was thinking what we haven't underlined is that in more traditional societies, there is a recognition of the value of the older person that in our modern ones we seem to have lost. An old person is a burden to society full stop. And, and then we see it as a threat. Whereas there are societies that are more cohesive where it's not just the individual or the family but the community in its entirety that, that is the fulcrum of, of, of action if you want and relationships that does continue to pay attention also to uh, the contribution that age and experience can bring. And if I may take the opportunity to make another point, uh, that is that the reason that we don't value that is because unfortunately we put a dollar or a euro sign on everything. And we monetize and we measure in value terms, which are monetary ones, what makes a society tick? It's the whole issue of why is household work by women not valued, doesn't show in the national accounts? Why, Apu was talking about grandparents taking care of the children, don't we measure that? Which is a value? Why don't we also recognize that very often and this is an important element of societal well-being. A person who's retired doesn't retire from life, retires from paid work, but then engages voluntarily in a number of socially beneficial activities. We don't mention those things. We don't measure them. We don't value them, therefore. And then we lose what makes our societies peaceful ones. So I, I, I fully agree with you. That's a point we should have underlined more. Thank you for raising it. Does any one of the panelists want to come in on this point? So, yes, please. Ms. Koju, yeah, please. Uh, con concerning uh, convention, uh, uh, I was on sixth uh, session of open-ended group in New York, and I've seen this difference between the developed countries and developing countries. Um, uh, and behind, we sit the members of NGOs. Uh, I was very much impressed by the Jap uh, Japanese uh, member of one NGO in Japan. He said, you know, I'm from one of the most developed countries, but after tsunami in our countries, old people are dying from hunger and without shelter. And his colleague, Yang, from uh, official representative of Japan immediately jumped on and said, you know, that's not official <laughs> statement of Japan, which I, uh, uh, I would like to point out that uh, countries which are not rich, they really need a convention uh, that the governments would be much more uh, um, 
pushed to accept laws, as uh, the lady said. Uh, therefore, I think that um, uh, 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 it will be, it will help what you said before, that in uh, traditional societies, old people are valued. Uh, I think that they are valued in not, less traditional as well, but they are not recognized. And uh, in my country, uh, uh, grandparents are actually safety net for all those families uh, who don't have jobs. So if the, our countries will recognize the value of older people and a convention could help, families will be happier and society will be happier. Great, thank you very much. If I can have the microphone to Eva Tomic, please. Uh, thank you very much. I come from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and this panel uh, uh, reminded me of an old African saying uh, going uh, something like this. Uh, when an old person dies, it is like a library, a rich library burns down. Um, and I think uh, the point is to use this great library as much as possible uh, as uh, when we can. Um, and it used to be that, um, I remember it used to be that one should spend each day uh, a part of your time with somebody less than seven years old and a part of your time also with somebody over 70 years old. And we seem to have moved from that. Um, and big part of the problem to me seems to be the stereotypes. Even when you look at the um, TV commercials, you know, they always um, depict the elderly in this um, romantized uh, way, sort of. Um, so I would very much like to hear uh, how the convention could help us overcome uh, the stereotypes we are embedded with, often without really knowing we have them. And I also wonder whether we shouldn't be, um, uh, whether there isn't a dogmatic shift that might be needed. I remember in the 90s, it um, used to be, you know, uh, we have the normative base for the human rights there. All we need is to implement it. But I wonder if that is really the way the life is. I mean, uh, laws need to follow life as it evolves in order for them to be effective. And I wonder, isn't it really the same with human rights instruments? I mean, when new needs come up, shouldn't ins instruments respond to that? Uh, disability convention was mentioned, and I can attest in Slovenia, it is being used especially by the NGOs, as a great new instrument helping disabled people to be more uh, recognized in the society. Uh, and it was the same for Women's Convention. And I think it might be the same for the Convention for Older Persons. And it might very well be that the next one might be the Convention for Youth. But then Perhaps this is good because we are responding to evolving needs of societies as they evolve is a question. Thank you. I'm going to uh, pass that uh, to Ms. Mikon, and I think it's um, uh, interesting also that HelpAge has already put out a position paper on, uh, on the convention, so kind of working on the assumption that when it comes, at least your position is already clear. We know which way you would like it to go. Would you like to reply to Ms. Tomic? Thanks so much. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for the, for the question. I think the stereotypes is really important um, because what we say, how we speak, whether it's factual or not, often becomes real in our minds. And I think um, the whole kind of ref slightly kind of referring to the previous point about societal um, stereotypes also um, and kind of exclusion of, of those who are older, it tends to it tends to be this real focus on productivity. This is what drives us growth and productivity. And somehow, because we look at this through the, and this is very much in the kind of OECD context, but it's being transferred um, elsewhere as well. So you look at work, formal work, 
and then you retire and it's black and white. One day you are productive, the next you are not, which is insane. It's not real, but that's how, that's how we view the world, and that's how we view people. And I think what's, conceptually, I, I think what is really interesting about aging societies is that, number one, there's nothing we can do about it. Actually, we've already aged. It has happened. And it really challenges the, the production model. It forces, it, it will force, it already is forcing us to think differently. It is forcing us to think differently about later life. And like you were saying, going back to the convention and stereotypes and what will it challenge, the convention, it would be very difficult for it to actually have a number. So the kind of chronological age would not be a basis for, for old age because it is so context specific. And I think also in terms of the kind of changes the convention could bring is to move from the largely protectionist approach to people in later life. And like you were saying, we don't, we don't look at a homogenous mass. We're looking at people currently over 60. This is a huge diversity. And everyone accumulates their experiences through life. So your life is completely different from anyone else's. But moving from this kind of protectionist approach to, to, to older people and later life to, a, to an approach of more choice and autonomy. And I think that's quite important. Thank you very much. Mr. Windegger, I thought I saw you wanting to come in as well on this point. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, uh, I cannot um, more than agree to, to use this library from the old people, yes? Definitely. And um, our point of view is the same, like just mentioned before. I mean, um, um, it's difficult what should be the contents of uh, such a convention because, I mean, as, as you know, we, we discussed or we have this... Um, guidelines from the Council of Europe. I mean, there we discussed the human rights perspective. I think this is very fine, it's a very good approach. Uh, otherwise, at the end, we are discussing also the social issues, and I think there it's going to be more difficult because pension system, we all know it's national policy, so uh, I think those are really the issues which are going to be very tough to discuss. Um, but what I also wanted to mention is, we forgot to the, so, uh, the question before. Um, I mean, we established our voluntary act and we have volunteer work. Here. And interesting is that, for example, most of the people who want to work voluntary are young people. I mean, um, maybe we have over a year about five or six people who call me or send me an email asking they want to work voluntary and uh, get involved. So I think definitely, and I agree with you, that we must do more to, to get those people um, in, involved and I mean, to give them the opportunity how to get involved. And I think what the problem is there, the lack of information. So, I mean, they don't know exactly what they can do. Sometimes we know they have the problem after retirement. They have, sorry they fall in a big hole and they don't know what to do. Yeah? And actually I think that's also an opportunity to step there on this period then to get them involved maybe in voluntary work or different kinds of work. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. I'm going to take one more question from the audience and then we're going to have to sadly already start wrapping up and going to closing statements. The lady in the third row, the lady who is, has the ambition to become very old, very late, very much later in life. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Nikolina Stepanovic and I represent Atlantic Council of Montenegro. Well, as I am in that period of time when I should learn from those who are not so young anymore, uh, I have come across on, them, on those people who don't want to listen uh, because my generation has already finished university and we are ambitious, we have some new ideas and uh, those people don't want to listen, they want to persuade, persuade us that they have right and don't uh, allow us to express ourselves, our own opinion. So I want to hear a comment or advice, anything. <laughs> Thank you. Right, well, Ms. Kojo, I think since you were the one who was saying, you know, we should listen to old people, uh, they're not listening to the young people, <laughs> at least not in Montenegro. That's true, you know. Uh, I have my daughter there 
who is always complaining that we older people don't listen to younger people. You know, uh, it's a struggle between generations, and that's nothing new. Uh, when I thought about what, how was it past, eh, they say, always say in uh, traditional family that was something. They understood each other, they worked well together, but that was not true, at least in Slovenia. Slovenian farmers had a habit uh, to make a contract between parents who left younger people the farm. It was very specific contract. How many, when they will get new shoes, when they will get new dresses, how many meals will they have? So they had struggled be, uh, uh, also in traditional families, even probably more because they were forced to live together. Now they are not forced anymore. And so we have to learn. You know, we are afraid of you young people because you know more, you know all these new things. You know, I never tweet. I don't know how to tweet. <laughs> Uh, uh, and you are afraid of us because you know that we, are, we were your teachers, uh, you are, we are experienced, so we really need, uh, uh, not only in the family, uh, intergenerational understanding, um, we need in the society as well. And uh, uh, I agree with Slovene Philanthropy, which, which is our, one of our NGOs, that we need uh, intergenerational centers. Well, uh, young and older people will meet daily. Uh, also because uh, grandparents in my country are living by themselves, uh, probably far away from, the, uh, from their children and grandchildren, and they should meet other grandchildren and uh, start to understand each other. I will just give you an example. My office is in one of the great buildings built in the 60s for older people. Only one person flats, many of older people. They didn't allow to put, how do you say, banks in the park because uh, at the evening oh, younger people would sit there. So they, they um, uh, didn't have banks, uh, even if they were old, just not to, have, to be troubled with younger people. So that's really what we need. And um, we have to learn to understand each other. Yeah, and when they're on the park benches, you have to stand up and give, the, give it to them because it's for, the, for, the, for you guys, the park <laughs> benches, not for the young guys. Yeah. Please, yes. I, I think it's a very welcome question and comment from our, our young uh, audience member um, because we've been talking a bit about uh, the challenges uh, of uh, older people, but clearly there are in Europe now important challenges affecting the young. I sometimes have the impression that we, we don't deal with age very well in our societies. And I sometimes have the impression that you move from being too young to too old in about one year. You, you go for 40 years being too young for politics, too young to have a position of responsibility, too young to be taken seriously. And then the next year, you're suddenly too old. <laughs> uh, and I'm at about the age where that's going to happen. Uh, but it's clearly we don't have a good relation to, to this age issue in, in our modern societies, uh, but let's think about the young for a moment. Um, especially in Southern Europe, the, the challenges are enormous. Uh, youth unemployment, first of all, and as we talk about the rights of older people, let's not forget that those rights have to be, have to fit with the rights of younger people. And again, in Portugal, looking at this issue, of course, we're very tempted to extend the working age, uh, um, uh, the retirement age, uh, a little bit uh, later. But clearly, this is an impact for, for employment and especially youth employment. Uh, and you see it immediately as you use your models, economic models. You, you change the retirement age and you see an impact in, in youth and employment. Uh, so we have to somehow bring this together. Uh, and we have somehow to improve the patterns uh, by which people in our societies, especially of different age, communicate. In universities, we have older professors teaching young people. This seems to work, seems to work for both. Um, but in our societies overall, in the general society, we don't have these patterns. After you leave university, you're working with young people in a young team, uh, and then you somehow we, we don't seem to be able very well to mix people of different ages in, 
in the work context, certainly in the social, uh, in the social context even worse, uh, where people seem to be, live in different worlds more and more, more than in the past. Um, uh, and so we have to definitely to work on this. Uh, in the convention, I hope it can introduce some new ideas. Not entirely new, because that's not the purpose of a convention, but ideas that we've been talking about for 10, 15 years and that they are still um, not the general consensus. I think a convention on the rights of other people can be very helpful in doing this. Uh, for example, I think there's now widespread consensus that those rights have to be uh, active rights, not just rights to be protected or to have a pension, but to have choice and autonomy. Uh, the convention should be able to recognize this and to make it explicit uh, in a way that it still isn't uh, because our, we, we feel tempted to think about the rights of older people as passive rights. So I think a convention could be very helpful in doing this, in changing our understanding of old age and helping us deal better with the age problem. Thank you very much. We're into our last uh, eight minutes, so I'm afraid I can't take any more questions from the floor, but I, I'm sure the panelists will be around for the coffee break, so you can tackle them if there's anything you really, really want to talk to them about. I want to give each of the panelists a chance, just anything that you wanted to say or still react to, uh, kind of as a, as a wrap-up uh, tour, and I'm going to start to my right with you, Ms. Pensieri. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just say one thing that brings youth and older people very much together. And that is, as they haven't entered their productive life or are seeking employment and don't find it. And if you look at older people who have already reached a pension age, there is a real challenge in being acknowledged by society because, and I've heard it so many times, people referring to someone saying he's worth a million dollar, two million. And to me, this is really terrible because we are worth what we are worth as human beings, young, old, and middle age because we don't want to discriminate against them either. So I think it's, it's the metrics with which we value a human being that are the problem. And a human being is a value in itself no matter whether the person is young or old or in between. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Windegger. Thank you very much. Yeah, for what I have learned today, I mean, we mentioned it before, I think it's important the flexibility. I think with regard to migration, what we heard before from my uh, colleague, with regard to retirement age, and I think also with regard to, to handling um, the issues with young, young people, I think this is really a word, uh, I mean, we, we use it very often, but the flexibility, I think in old age, I think is very important to get people involved in the process because it's not only a convention or uh, uh, something what we have to discuss. I think it's a mixture of problems and uh, it's important to do something now and immediately. Thank you very much. Mrs. Mikon. Um, Flavia said much more elegantly uh, than I could ever could what I wanted to say, but this whole issue about kind of ages and the kind of problem of productivity, if that is the focus. Um, one more thing that I, I wanted to say earlier, and I didn't, is th when it comes to normative gaps, um, something that we notice very, very often, and that is the issue of, of women. And I just wanted to really raise that because I don't want to miss it. If we, even though there are frameworks in place, um, our convention even, we, we tend to, we, we notice that data on older people is so poor that if you look at, for example, violence against women, the data collection stops at 49. We're not talking about older people, we're talking about 49. So as long as you're, you, you, you reproduce, there's data on you. As soon as you don't, you are either not considered a woman or you're considered as not, you know, violence not being a possibility for you, which is, which is really an outrage. And I think that whether it's a convention or another instrument, but actually making, like we're saying, a discriminating by age happens a lot. And, and being very specific about that and having the information and data is really important. Great, thank you very much. I think there's also a wonderful job that your organization does getting the statistics of who wants to be independent and who needs the help. Ms. Kojo, please, your closing statements. <laughs> You know, uh, these uh, age limit of uh, 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 
discussing violence against women, uh, uh, actually, uh, it's my experience is that old women return to their husbands everything they suffered in the young age. So uh, we have to start to look at the old families. Uh, men shouldn't recognize that they are threatened by their wives. So that's very hidden. Uh, the other thing is the problem of old mothers with, um, uh, with sons who are drunkards. That's a big issue in Slovenia. Those women suffer very much. Uh, the message I would like to uh, give you today is, you know, we have in Slovenia a very nice expression. Uh, son, um, you bring, you push your father to the door, your son will push you through the door. So listen to older people now, because I repeat again, we are opening the door for your well-being in your old age. You know what? you will do to us, your children will do much more to you because they are learning from you as we learn from our parents. Right, thank you very much. And you get, you, you get to close or, you know, is this going to be the magic thing where a politician says, I have nothing more to say? <laughs> no, but I, I was going to say that because I, I, I just delivered my conclusion. No, no, I want to thank uh, the, the, um, the organizers for putting up the panel because this uh, topic, uh, it's a difficult topic to deal with for politicians uh, for many reasons. Um, sensitive topic, you also don't want to come across as someone that can control the population. Um, uh, and so it's a very difficult issue, but we have to talk about it. Uh, a threat, certainly, but an opportunity. We didn't talk so much about an opportunity, but I think uh, for example, for healthcare, um, the healthcare industry, improving healthcare, using the internet, the so-called internet of things to revolutionize healthcare. This could be, we all politicians in Europe right now are looking for ways to increase investment. Um, and it has to be real investment. It can't be artificial, create a bubble, and then we have another crisis. And healthcare and the way healthcare has to adapt to demographic changes, this for me is a crucial issue, so perhaps a topic for the future. Uh, let's try to look at it as an opportunity and let's try to create the right fora to promote um, dialogue between different generations. Uh, I, th I, s I somehow sense that we've been working a lot on other forms of dialogue and we have neglecting this particular one, perhaps because we think it's easy and comes naturally, but that's not quite true. You need to have the right institutions to promote it as well. Right. Thank you very much. Can I thank the panelists for taking the time to come to BLED to share their knowledge for you? It wasn't that far. For others, it was a bit further. Um, uh, I found it extremely enlightening, and I think we've you know, touched on such an incredibly broad range of subjects. People are going to go home with new ideas uh, and, and stimulating uh, ways forward. And then we will see if we're back here in 15 years discussing how the open-ended working group on the convention is still open-ended or whether anything has come out of it. I want to thank you, the audience, uh, for your contributions and your questions and invite you all. There's a coffee break on uh, now. And after that, the other panel, uh, the next panel will be here uh, in the same room. And I look forward to seeing you then as well. Thank you very much.